Once again, welcome. This is Mastering Mechanics with the Pasco Wireless Smart Cart. We're going to go over the Smart Cart components today. What's in it? What do we have? As well as the anatomy, directionality, things like that. We're going to jump straight into mechanics applications, which for me as a classroom teacher, this is my favorite part. What can we do with it? So we're going to look at the acceleration on an inclined plane. Start really simple using our SparkView software. This is just what it sounds like a really common entry level uh, physics experiment. Then we're going to get to tension and net force. This is also a bit more conceptual based. Um, I found this one of the common misconceptions in my classroom has to do with the direction net force and the motion of the object. So we're going to take a look at that. Then we're going to get into something a little more complex with a capstone workbook on the work and energy theorem. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a work and energy theorem. So we'll be looking at the kinetic energy and work done by an elastic string. We'll do momentum and collisions again, more on the conceptual side. I taught conceptual physics um, during my time teaching. So I'm very much in love with that type of content. And so we'll get to see that proportionality between uh, mass, momentum, and the inverse relationship between mass and velocity. Again, we'll get really complicated with capstone, do some uh, use the capstone calculator to do equations for us and calculate things. So we'll see oscillations of our cart, and then we'll get to actually use our centripetal and gyro sensors in the smart cart. So some smart cart components. So obviously the smart cart is a smart cart and it comes with the cart. You can see how it moves. We have hooks that come with it. It comes with its own magnetic bumper and it comes with a plastic bumper and not shown here is our charging cable. So it is rechargeable, which is really useful. I find in the classroom less hunting around for batteries. And so all of this comes out of the box when you get your smart cart. As far as what's inside, there are three built-in sensors. So we have wheel encoders. So that's for the position, velocity, and acceleration. It has a force sensor. Something to note about this sensor, while it is pretty robust, it can handle 100 Newtons both directions. It is still probably the piece that is broken the most. So we highly recommend that you store them not with the screw attached. So make sure to detach it. And also I always tell my students to store it upside down. That way it's unlikely to roll and take a diving um, jump off of your counters. It also has the acceleration and gyro sensors for it has three axes that it works on. We have Velcro tabs, a spring plunger for collisions and explosions. So if we want either elastic, inelastic, or an explosion type for our momentum, which we'll see today. It has a mass tray, which fits our masses perfectly, which is really useful when you are trying to get your smart cart moving quickly, keeps them in place. It has multiple tie points on both sides of our cart. We have our charging port, of course, how we turn it on and a where we can connect an accessory, which we will use today. It also connects to your computer using wireless connectivity via Bluetooth Low Energy BLE, also known as Bluetooth 4. So the great thing about that is it will connect directly uh, into the software and you do not have to go through your computer's systems to attach your Bluetooth. As far as our directionality, so it has a nice big positive X button. So that is the positive direction for our cart, negative being the opposite way, up and down, up is positive, down is negative, right is positive, left is negative for our gyroscope and acceleration sensors. So the part I actually really like. So we're gonna get straight into uh, acceleration on the inclined plane. You might notice that we have this little paper here. It does, we have this on our website. This is a fully prepared um, lab document as well as setup. So we can see over here that I have this set up in the corner. So I have my cart set on an inclined plane. I have the positive sign facing down. So its direction will say down the, the ramp is positive. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up SparkView. So if you're not familiar, SparkView is one of our two softwares, Capstone being the other one, which we'll also go over today. So there's multiple ways you can enter into SparkView. 
The one I'm gonna use today is actually open a PASCO experiment because this experiment is pre-set up. It's part of our essential physics. And we can go and find that we have multiple in here, but we are going to do acceleration on an incline plane. So that'll open with a pre-set up lab. So it's easy for everyone to take uh, data. Students can get right into the lab quickly. There's no need for much setup. So when we're gonna turn our smart cart on and connect, notice that it comes up. It comes up with a six digit code. It's also color coded, which is fun. And you, other devices that are in the room, such as if you're in a classroom setting, you'll probably see multiple. The one at the top is the one closest to the computer, uh, which is convenient for students. If ever they connect to the wrong one or someone connects to theirs, just have them turn the smart card off and on again. It's the fastest way to disconnect. And that way they don't have to go and search who stole their smart card. All right, so we're already set up and it's as easy as hit start, push it up the ramp, stop it so it doesn't hit too hard. And now we have great data that we've already collected. So you'll notice it is kind of small, but the quickest way we can do a scale to fit here. And so our original goal is, well, how do we find acceleration on an incline? So there are so many ways that we could, obviously probably the easiest is to take a slope of our velocity graph, which we can do via multiple ways. You can hit this, but notice that it does not take the slope. It takes the slope of the whole thing, not the portion we want. So we can just select the portion that we want and quickly get an acceleration here of 1.69. Well, that's really great for entry level. We want to show that there is a connection between acceleration, velocity, and position. But also for, say, our more advanced users or anyone going down, we now can ask, well, will the acceleration be the same on the way up and the way down the incline? So this is a common question, and depending on what level your students are, you might have a slightly different answer. So looking at our graph, we can say, oh, no, that, that looks the same, which makes sense. We have the same slope. We should have roughly the same forces. We should have the same acceleration up and down. However, let's say our students are a little more advanced. We've, gotten, we've talked about forces before. Well, the acceleration is not exactly the same, right? We know that while this is a low friction cart, it is not a frictionless cart. So there will be some friction. So if the friction is ignored, our acceleration is the same. But if friction is accounted for, can we actually see the difference in the acceleration? And so this is quick enough that we can take good data and it's very accurate, but we can also see that our acceleration is slightly different from when we are going up the track versus down the track. So when we are going up the track is about 1.72 and down the track, it's about 1.65 meters per second squared. So there is a slight difference due to the direction of the friction changing while it is going up and down that track. So we can see that this smart cart can take really quick data, but we can also get really more in depth for our students. So next up, let me close this out. I highly recommend you always oops, close these out. It just works better if you just close and restart the program. So next, I want to talk about tension and net force. So I have a super pull pulley set up here. It's a little hard to see. I know it's on the edge of my camera here. And so I'm going to hook up my hook, hook up my hook to my smart cart. I'm going to turn this one on. And I need to get this out of the way because it's in the way now. All right. And I have pre-prepared a uh, mass for this. So this is 102 grams, pretty much exactly, which will give us almost exactly one Newton of force. So from the gravity of this. So when this object is at rest, we will have one Newton of force. So a really common difficult point for students is what happens to the net force once an object is accelerating? And then how do, might that change depending on the object's motion? 
So we're going to hook this up. And when the cart is released from rest, will the tension in the string be less than, equal to, or greater than one Newton? I'm going to set up this poll while I get set up over here with SparkView. So go ahead, answer the poll. One. All right. So we're going to reconnect our smart cart. Notice there are two smart carts, but my blue one is closer. So I'm going to I'm going to connect to that one. We have thirty percent have answered the poll. Don't be shy; it's anonymous. And in this one, I really don't care about my other things. I really just want my force. So I'm doing a sensor setup here. So I'm going to select the sensor I want and just have a graph of it. All right. And it's always good form. Sometimes your force sensors from getting banged, pushed around, having the hook screwed in can often be a little off. So it's best to zero them when you have that chance before you start. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and end our poll. All right, so it does seem like the majority think it will be less than one Newton, equal than one Newton, or greater than one Newton. So let's take a look. So it's wonderful that we have split, and you will probably notice if you asked your classroom this, it will probably also be split. So we can see at rest, we have just one Newton. And I'm going to put some masses in this cart just to slow it down a little bit. Otherwise, it goes a little fast for me. All right. So at rest, we can see it is at one Newton. But when I let go, and that's why I have those rubber bumpers there, very, very useful, these elastic bands. Uh, we can see that as soon as the cart started moving, when I released it from rest, it started to accelerate and our tension was lower, was less than one Newton. We can get a average of that if we want. It's really easy to go to statistics and get the mean so we can get our average. It was about 0.86. So our net, for, or our net force was pointing in the direction of the motion in this case. So, we see that our tension was less than one Newton because it had to be. Otherwise, our cart would not have accelerated because the mass wouldn't have accelerated if the tension was equal or greater than one Newton. Well, one Newton, it would have accelerated up, which would have been a very, very odd scenario. So this is a great starter for your students. But once they get this, they're like, OK, cool. It accelerated that way. I get it. Well, what next? Well, now we push it, literally. So. I'm now going to do the same exact thing, but I'm going to push the cart and say, well, after I'm done pushing the cart, it will be moving uh, away from me. Will the tension be greater than, less than, or equal to one Newton? So again, we can start it. It's roughly one Newton. I can push it. Oops, a little too hard there. Thanks, Alec. So we can go and look and see that it is still less than one Newton. And in fact, it's pretty similar to what we had before. Not exact, it's kind of odd, but pretty similar. So let's say your students got that, they have that down. Well, let's make it even more complicated, just for fun. So I have here my uh, smart fan. So the smart fan is a fan that hooks into our smart cart. And so it can be timed exactly when you want it to. So this plugs into our little accessory port here. And I took one mass off because it's a little heavier than the masses, but that just gets it to roughly the same mass as it was before. So when I'm doing that, I can there we go. So now that that's set up, I can run our fan. So I'm going to add a new page over here. 
And so I can, the smart fan accessory will just pop up. I can just straight on turn it on so you can see it. Maybe you can hear it. It goes in the opposite direction, which is probably my fa favorite part about that because it's always hard to turn things around. And then we can also turn it on to auto. So auto will just turn it on when I hit play. And I'm going to set up another force first time graph. I don't want these on here yet. So now what's going to happen if we use our fan? So we're going to first, if the fan is pushing in the same direction as the string, so working the direction it's facing, will the tension be greater or less than it was without the fan? And then we're going to reverse that fan and then say, well, was that going to be greater than or less than it was before? So you can start really playing around with this and do a lot of fun things. So we're on auto, handy dandy meter stick pushing me away. Cool. So I'm going to just start it so the fan's going. So we can see that, yes, it was still less than one Newton, as we would expect from our previous ones. However, compared to our last run, that is at least a little bit less than our um, tension was in our previous run. And we can now flip it the other way and try again. So now this is pushing in the opposite direction of the tension from the string on the cart. Oh, my fan went a little rogue there. And we can now also see the mean here. And notice that that is significantly larger, which makes sense because we had a force now opposing that, that tension had to be higher to still cause that fan to accelerate. So, and if you might have been able to tell a little bit, it did accelerate slower. So that's just some fun ways you can really play with um, our net force. And we can get a lot of information from this fan. You can also try it with different masses. You can throw a pulley on the other side and make a, you know, a more of a different type of modified Atwoods machine. So there's a lot of different ways that you can play around. And I highly uh, encourage you to do so with the smart cart. It's pretty easy to set up and can create some novel situations. All right, so that was kind of my really heavy conceptual side that I enjoy, but we're also gonna take it into our work energy theorem. So our, um, this is all found on the PASCO experiment. It has a capstone workbook with it. And I'll just kind of open that up to show you guys where you can find it and what it will look like. So we have our huge experiment library. This is just one of the ones we have. It is part of a set that comes with all of these workbooks attached to them. So I'm not gonna save that. So I'm going to open up a, the workbook by itself so I can go into capstone. So this is our first time looking at capstone today. Hopefully not everyone's first ever. And I can open up the experiment. I have all these saved here for me. And so this is our template. So we have our workbook here. So the cool thing about the capstone workbook is it's just everything. So you have your introduction, you have your theory, you have your equipment list, you have a photo of the setup, you have a description on how to set it up. So, and, and it also importantly, I think for a lot of teachers, uh, unless you really love grading, it has a really easy way to grade. So all the student answers will be put, can be typed directly in here. So for example, the mass of a cart, the beauty of these carts, they are roughly equal to the mass of one cart mass. So they're both about 250 grams. So a cart with two masses is roughly 0 0.75 kilograms. And the cart with one mass is roughly 0.5 kilograms or half a kilogram. So we don't need this pull anymore, but we do need an elastic band. So we're going to be using this elastic band as our force, and it's going to be a non-constant force because it is elastic. It will change based on how far it is stretched. And so 
our goal here is to figure out, well, is the amount of work done by the elastic on the cart going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy of our cart? So to start us off, we are going to just push it back and take some data. So main thing is like I need to make sure I push it back roughly the same amount each time and make sure I actually connect. I always get so excited. I sometimes forget to connect my devices. So you'd have to connect your devices or they uh, don't work. So we'll be connecting our blue smart card again. And I do like to always zero out my force sensor just to be safe. So now we're gonna push this back uh, roughly, let's say 70 centimeters. And so I'm gonna record. Notice that it stopped on its own. So both SparkView and Capstone have the ability to change recording conditions. So in this case, it has a stop condition after it has traveled a certain amount of distance. That way I don't get tons of extra data that I don't want. So I did that with one. Now I'm gonna repeat and do that with two cart masses. Push that out to 70 again, hit record. You might've noticed that it looked like it was going slower, which makes sense. It was much more massive. Then we can go to the work done. Oh, it's nice when the data comes out good. So this actually already has it pre-set out, right? If we want to find the work done using a force sensor, we wanna have a force versus a position graph and then find the area or the integral of that. Something you always wanna try to do is connect your current lesson to past lessons. So thinking about forces and Hooke's law and force on a spring, does this follow Hooke's law? No, no, it definitely does not follow Hooke's law, right? We have a curved line, so we can go back and cover lots of different things with just one lab, which is always great. We can see that our work is roughly the same, which it should be because it was the same elastic over the same distance. And so we can put our, they could type their answers right here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on typing, but we can put our answers in and then we can go and comparatively look at the change in kinetic energy by looking at the final velocity or maximum velocity of our carts. So we could calculate this out. I don't want to right now because I don't wanna do math in front of a live audience. But also for your grading, um, they have, if you have a teacher account, you can log in and get all of the data, all of the answers to make grading really easy. Or if you wanna, you know, say have a TA do your grading for you, all of that is ready if you download this. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that so you can see what a finished version looks like. So this is the capstone workbook with all of the answers in it. So it has what we would expect the masses of these things to be. It has our graphs that we would expect them to get. It has some data that we'd expect them to get. They may not have the exact amount depending on how far they pushed and you know the strength of their elastic string, but this is what we would expect. And we would expect that our kinetic energy is very, very similar to the work done by just a slight amount of percentage difference, which makes sense because again, these are low friction but they are not friction less. So that's our capstone workbook. I find them, I, I didn't get to use these in my classroom, but they, as someone who's been in the classroom, these seem very easy to grade. And I always liked having my students to have their answers, their graphs, everything in one spot as quickly as possible because I wanted to spend more time in the lab, less time writing. So again, with just that lab, we, and a piece of elastic, and this elastic band is really useful. So we got to cover Hooke's law. We got to cover how do you find the work done by the elastic band and find the amount of change in kinetic energy done by that work. We're gonna take it back to 
a little more conceptual with conservation and momentum. So what's better than one smart cart? Obviously it's two. So with two smart carts, you can do a lot with your, that's why you always store them upside down. So I'm gonna take this hook off because I don't need it. And instead we're gonna install our magnetic bumpers. So our magnetic bumpers are what they sound like. They are magnets. And so they're opposing so that they will bounce off each other with very little or less in contact, instead using the magnets to apply that force for us. So we're gonna run this with SparkView and it's gonna give us a conceptual look at how we can use the cart masses to explore the proportionality and um, collisions of these. We can also use our spring plungers see as well. So I'm going to go ahead and open up SparkView now. So the last time we opened SparkView, we did sensor data. We've done open a passcode uh, experiment. So I'm going to go to sensor data. Something you may or may not have noticed when you were doing this, when you choose a sensor or a wireless device to connect, it will pop up ideas for what it thinks you might be using that sensor for. And so these are called quick starts. Um, you'll notice that I did have to turn my red Pasco smart cart back on. They do turn off after some amount of time of inactivity or not being connected, which is really good in between classes to help save your batteries. So I connect to smart cart and it already is asking me, well, is this a conservation of momentum lab? Why, why yes it is. So I can just go to that quick start and it's already mostly set up for me. Note, sometimes it will disconnect uh, your sensors. So if you ever feel like, what happened to my sensors? You can just go back up to the Bluetooth button and connect them. So I need both sensors. So I'm gonna need to wait to connect both of them. You can kind of see in the shading here that we have our velocity of our red cart on one side and our velocity of our red cart on another. So I'm just gonna really quickly run this and. Let's see if people notice what's what was wrong about my setup. So there is a couple things to note. One, you might see, well, my momentum was positive and then it was negative. How did that happen? Well, my carts are now facing each other, which means they are no longer using the same frame of reference. The fastest way to change that is just change the sign on one of them. So now that looks a little more like what we'd expect. Um, oh, it does. So sometimes you'll see that, oh, these are lined up. That's really great. But that's not always going to be true unless you select this button here, which is keep the origins aligned. So whenever you're running a conservation momentum experiment, I highly recommend that you do, in fact, keep your origins aligned. Uh, that's probably my most common mistake where I get frustrated. Why is the lab working? And it's just because my scale is off and I hadn't realized it. So with our cart masses, it's really easy to say double. So now my red cart is double the mass that it was before. So we can see how that affects the amount of momentum it transfers. Same thing. We can triple the mass of our cart. and see the amount of momentum. But I really think this is best seen in either the explosions or the Velcro, which is what I'm gonna do now. So, all right, when we're doing explosions, so notice I rotated the direction of my cart. So now they are facing, let's see if we can see that on the camera, the same direction. So I gotta change my sign back on my red cart. So I'm gonna just change the sign again. So when, Yeah. So when you are depressing the plunger, something to note, um, it's much better if you do not use your finger, you can use like another extra mass or some other device. It just prevents your fingers from basically getting a little sticky on this. So we, we start with zero momentum. And really quickly, we can clearly see
that we have roughly the same momentums, but in opposite directions. Now, we can do the same thing, but again, let's try doubling the mass. So you can have students predict, and I really always liked having my students predict. Ooh, we're a little off. Okay, so looks like my feet probably when it fell, we got a little off balance. There we go. Oop, I don't want that data, so let's just start over. So we can see, hopefully, we can already tell which car was more massive on SparkView, the cart with the blue line, which is uh, maybe a little confusingly, that was my red cart, was more massive. So it's was twice as massive, so it has about half the velocity of our blue cart. And we can do that with any amount of mass. These conveniently uh, stack and hook into each other as well if you want to get extremely massive. And we can do the same thing with our Velcro. So do note that when you do this, you want to make sure you depress. You might feel like you get this plunger stuck. You just have to press this down and release slowly. I have found that sometimes it's easier to do upside down. Uh, so if you're finding like you're having a hard time completely depressing that, uh, try turning it upside down. It, it seems to work a lot better. All right, same thing. I do need to change the sign on one of my carts. And again, we can clearly see how we had our momentum cut in half when we doubled. And we can do this again with any amount of cart masses to really show students how our mass and velocity are inversely proportional when our momentum is conserved as it is in our collisions. So that one we quadrupled. So we started with roughly 0.63 and it dropped down to one or 0.16, so roughly quarter. So hopefully this shows how we can quickly take a lot of different runs of data, because we just took nine runs of data there of all sorts of different collisions. You can later have students use that to calculate and show that momentum was conserved, or you can also take it more conceptually and ask for proportionality. If we quadruple the mass, what happened to velocity and so forth. All right, so I'm going to close that one down, check how we're doing on time. All right. So again, with the cart masses, it's really simple to show that inverse relationship between mass and velocity. But again, you also can get plenty of uh, quantitative data. You don't have to do it qualitatively. So you can do it either way. So we're going to now take it up really high. You'll notice I did ramp that up and I'm going to see if we can angle my camera a little better. So you can see. So I'm going to reattach the hook. And so we're going to be oscillating this. So when you, a lot of times oscillations are done with springs using a force sensor hooked up vertically, which is still an excellent way to do it. But I think for a lot of schools or locations, if you're buying a smart cart, you're often not buying some of the other force sensors and motion detectors because of that. So while it does introduce more friction to the system, it's still a really cool look at it. So we are going to look at Hooke's Law. We're going to compare the force acceleration velocity and position graphs. And then we can also use the line and bar graphs uh, to compare our spring potential energy, our kinetic energy, our total energy, and our energy lost using capstone calculators. All right, so I'm going to open up a template for the oscillations because uh, it has a lot of calculations built in that I built in previously. So again, we got to connect our smart cart which I believe is still on. Yep. So I'm just going to connect to our blue one here. So it's probably high enough. I do like to ramp this one up really high 
just because I find like I get better data when it's as vertical as possible or as reasonable. So for this, again, I just want to get the force and position so I can do a quick Hooke's law and get my spring constant. So I'm going to set that oscillating. And so I already had a line set up there. So we can really quickly notice it stopped after five seconds because I always have a habit of talking and not stopping. So I like to set stop conditions into it. So we can see that it is roughly 6.5. So I'm going to go into my calculator and looks like I'm using a slightly different spring than I was before. So inside my calculator, I have all these calculations, one for the kinetic energy, where it's the one half mass times velocity squared and our spring potential energy, one half the spring constant times position squared. And our total energy is adding our kinetic energy and spring potential energy. And our energy loss is just looking at what was our maximum energy at the beginning versus what is it currently. So I have a second page for this so that we can run it. So now that my uh, cart is stopped, because I do want to start it from stop, I'm going to start recording. And we can get really clean data from just this cart. Notice we do see that our energy is going down. That's because, well, there is, again, friction. We can compare our position to our velocity and see the phase shifts. We can do all this while it is running, uh, which I always like to have labs that I could just touch and move on and start talking about. We can compare that to an its acceleration. And oops, it's acceleration. And you might have noticed that there was this bar graph going on over here. So spark view a little bit, but capstone really has the, um, the power to run it, has this bar graph feature. So the cool part about it is we can go back and do playbacks. So this little green button down here, if you've never used it, we can go back at any point in our recording and see where we were at and what we were doing. So we can start the very beginning and it will go at different speeds. It will go fast if you took a long period of time, you want to go quicker or it will go uh, slower and do slow-mo as well. So just looking at it at quarter speed, you can see where I pushed it. I added kinetic energy to the system, then spring potential by compressing and then released my cart. And it will go through and do a playthrough. So this is great to show really any level of student, but I think this sort of visualizer can be really helpful to beginning students on what is happening to the energy, how it's transferring between the two different types of energy we have here, as well as how that adds up to our total energy and what is going on with energy lost. Why is it decreasing in its maximum amplitude? Um, when you set them up here, I really like this add similar measurement. So let's say if I just wanna look at the total energy, not a very interesting graph without anything else going on. However, if you go to add similar measurement, I can add anything else that has joules as a unit. So I can add my kinetic energy. I can add my spring potential energy. And then I can also add my energy loss. And we can all see this at a slowed down rate so we can really see what's going through and analyze it. Um, so just one of a very powerful way that we can use capstone to explore really any part of this oscillation, whether we're looking at its motion, acceleration, velocity, position, or if we're looking at the different energies from an energy conservation standpoint. Um, and all of this done with just a single smart card. We didn't need to use a motion detector or a force sensor here. It was all built in to the Pasco wireless smart card. All right. So hopefully that shows you just uh, some of the fun things. I really always enjoyed doing oscillations. I just kind of find the oscillations a little hypnotic to watch as well as the bar graph. So it's really nice to see it displayed all out here in different modes for your different students. So some of you might have questioned why was there no gravitational potential energy involved there? Well, just to, I won't go through the whole thing because I don't think we need it, but safe to say that if you redefine your equilibrium point, your um, gravitational potential energy component 
essentially just cancels out. So as long as we redefine our equilibrium point as the new stretch from the mass of the cart, we do not have to worry about gravitational potential energy. Of course, if you want your students to go into it, you can, but again, it's just a way when you're starting out to help simplify for them, or if you really wanna press them, make them prove this themselves. All right, so this is gonna require some movement on both Alex and my part. I can hear him furiously typing over there, but I am gonna, maybe we'll fit. So this experiment is a smart cart. It's straight part of our smart cart out of the box experiments, which are hopefully as they sound, you kind of can just use these experiments straight out of the box. You, you really need a smart cart, maybe you need a track, but most of these you can just go and uh, do them. So this one is really cool in that it uses our smart cart gyroscope and accelerometer so that we can show the relationship between rotational, and velo rotational velocity and acceleration. So it does have a full lab write-up. It has some pre-made data in case you wanted that, but now we actually have to run it. So I have it over here. Require some movement, make sure it doesn't hit anyone. You okay there, Alec? <laughs> I think we're good. I think as long as carefully. Um, let's, that's always the problem with cameras. There we go, a little angled. Okay, so I just need one of my smart carts and I'm going to attach the only thing I haven't used yet as part of the smart cart components, which is our bumper. So I'm gonna just attach this because I wanna measure the force as um, on the smart cart, as well as the acceleration and this rotational velocity as it goes around. So get us set up. I was not using it, so it hopefully turned off. Now it's on. And you can have students set this up on their own, or again, you can make a template for them. I'm going to make sure I close out. I always forget to close out so we don't have two running. So I'm opening just a template for the centripetal acceleration. So this just pre gave me my axes of acceleration force and angular velocity. I'm going to connect my smart cart. This is going to be our red smart cart. And now I get to spin it. So you can do this with a swivel chair. If you have a nicer setup, obviously use a nicer setup, but it works pretty well with just a swivel chair, um, which I would say most schools probably have a swivel chair somewhere in their possession. You might even have one in your classroom. So if you get this going, you just wanna start it after I'm done pushing it so we don't get any jarring in it. So depending on which way you spun it, so this case, I am spinning it counterclockwise, which is why it's showing up there on the right. Oh, and you'll notice I did not zero out my force sensor, which is why you should always do that. But we still get pretty good data anyway. There's just that offset from the force sensor. Uh, if you're wondering why the offset is so large, uh, this smart cart was in fact dropped at one point with the hook on, which has caused the offset. So it can be fixed by zeroing it out, but it's why we, we try to always store them not with the hook or any attachment to the force sensor. Oh. All right, so, oops. So we can see from this that, oh uh, no, I like my first one better. I thought my acceleration looked good. So we can see from it that we can get a, a parabolic relationship. I'm going to set B to zero because it really should be. Um, it's just a little off because I'm just using a swivel chair. 
And when I do that, you'll notice we have this relationship of A omega squared. So this is basically our A is actually our radius. So the radius of rotation for this, and I can read it off of uh, my ramp as well, but from our data, we can see that our radius is 0 0.4, 0, bleh, 0 0.423 um, meters. And we can then relate that the, if we change our radius, we will decrease our acceleration. So if I make my radius smaller by moving my end stop, we can redo this. Get it going roughly the same speed, although it's not super important. And we can compare that I cut my radius roughly, a little more, a little too much maybe, a little over half. And we can see how that relates to the acceleration that we experience from that. So not, a, I don't, I didn't run this particular lab in my classroom, although of course there's rotational labs, but you tend to use pulleys. But this is a way that you can use the smart cart to measure rotation. Um, which I think is really cool. It's not tends to be a very used feature of the smart cart. Most everyone uses their position and um, the position and force sensors, but that is an option for you to use the smart cart. Ooh, okay, so we were really fast because I wanted to make sure we hit everything because uh, I thought all of these were really fun labs that showed different modes that you can use, different ways you can use your smart cart. So we are getting to the end, although I will, of course, be here to answer any questions. If you uh, are interested or you want to get more support or have access to any of these materials, your best bet is to contact your regional PASCO representative. You can find them at pasco.com support. This is also a little QR code if you would like to use that. We do have about nine minutes or so left. So if anyone wants to see anything more, feel free to ask. Um, on that note, I didn't even stop to ask Alec if he had any questions for me that should be answered at the front. Alec, were there any good questions that were you wanted to cover more or? Yeah, actually, if there's one thing that you could show us, there were a few times on the graph display where you were selecting data and applying either a linear fit or statistics like the average. Could you show us that one more time, uh, pointing out the buttons that you Oh, yeah, absolutely. Either Sorry. In, either in Capstone or Spark View. I think that would be helpful to see. OK, uh, I think I have time to do both. So I'm just I have uh, saved data up. So let's do uh, just go simple with the acceleration on incline with Spark View. So when you are doing these, this is your main key down here. Um, this will give you all of your most useful buttons. So we have this slider. So this goes from a selection tool to a grabbing tool. This is really useful. This is just scale to fit, uh, which is important to make sure your things are scaled. You might wonder why did it zoom in? Well, it zoomed in on those selections. So if you have a selection and you say scaled fit, it will scale to that selection. For our path, um, we can now use this to do lots of things. I'm gonna just get rid of it to clear everything out for us so we can show it again. I'm going kind of fast because I'm excited. So if I need to slow down, please say so in the chat and Alec will tell me to uh, slow down. So let's say we're doing velocity and we wanna get a linear fit to this. There are two ways we can get there. We can one, do this button that says show high linear fit. Do make sure, this is my most common mistake, is you're selected on the right graph. So you want to look at your graph legend. So I want to do my velocity graph. So I got to make sure I'm selected on the green one. And if I do linear fit, it's pretty good because I did a good job of stopping my data. But this data is throwing it off a little bit. So I'm going to slide to a selection tool and select just the data I'm interested in, which is when I was not touching it or slowing it down. 
And so if I can select that. Notice though, when I select these other options pop up. So I could have selected first and then gone to show hide linear fit. Same result, two ways to get there. Similarly, like let's say if I wanna do the average or the mean. So let's go, if we wanna say, what was our average acceleration using the acceleration graph? I can select this. So I'll select first on this one and I can go to the show hide statistics, which will pop up. I could do minimum, maximum, mean or average, standard deviation. It will just count how many and also area under the curve. So I'm gonna do mean here in this case. So it gets me my mean and I can show through this, my different graphs that I in fact have the same regardless of how I get it. So my acceleration here, it looks like to be negative 1.12. And here it is negative 1.12 with rounding. You can also do that on your, on a quadratic, which I didn't really show today, but same thing. I can select and instead of a linear fit, I can just choose a curve fit. It does have line on here if you wanna do linear, but we wanna do quadratic. And so we can pop up a quadratic fit as well. And now you might say, well, where's the acceleration in this? Well, if we think of our kinematics equation, x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, really focusing on that one half a t squared. So this would be our one half a t squared term. So a little confusingly, our a here is one half of the acceleration. It's not acceleration, but one half of it. So if I double, uh, 0.562 in my head. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get 1.12 as well. So regardless of how we show, do it, we can show that there is a relationship between our position velocity and acceleration graphs. To show that in capstone, let's see, what's a good data for our capstone? Um, Oh, let's do oscillations because that one's that's plenty. So opening up capstone, oops. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not recording any data. That's when it tends to get the most weird is if you're trying to connect multiple sensors. How can uh, we see the zooming features on this as well? The zooming? Oh, like uh, the scaling? Yeah. So you can, I sometimes just get lazy and use my scroll bar, but you can click on the sides and this is both in capstone and in spark view and it will basically stretch as needed if you click on the center of it you can move it and if you really mess up and you have no idea where you are anymore both uh, and it's actually in a similar placement it's that first button it looks a little different in capstone and in spark view but this will go and scale to show all of your data which is really useful, especially if, you know, everyone's had a, a student who's just like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't find it. It's nowhere. It just, just really train them to hit the scale to fit button, just kind of bring it back home so they can see things again. <laughs> um, very similar to how we got our linear fit in uh, Spark View. It works the same in Capstone, just your buttons are a little different. So notice this button was depressed. And so now I can apply a proportional fit, a linear, weighted linear. We have a lot of options in Capstone. Um, it's meant to be more of a heavy computational tool for that reason. So if I do that, it'll apply it to the whole thing. I can also do selection here. It's a slightly different button. It says highlighter. So I can highlight certain areas and also do curve fit specifically of those areas. And you can shift it and your data will shift as you shift your highlighted area. If we want to go look at a really complex graph, we can do same things. We can also do cool tangent lines. We can do means, we can do maxes. Um, so the statistic button is here. So you can show it in tabular format. I actually do like it in tabular format. Uh, we can do maximum, we can do mean, although the mean on a curve graph is a little nonsensical. Um, but right, we can do our maximums, we can do our minimums. Uh, you can also do exact points. 
right? You can pull this to scroll through. Um, so I really highly encourage you and your students, because I think some of the best ways we learn these tools is by playing around with them. So I do really encourage have, setting aside time for yourself or them to start kind of clicking around and seeing what can you do with data you collect, either uh, regardless of if you're using SparkView or Capstone. I do recommend um, Capstone for more of your higher level students and SparkView for more of like, depending on your more conceptual classes or high school classes. All right, we are pretty much at our time. I will stick around after, but I am going to stop the recording here. So we are at exactly our uh, 60 minute mark. So thank you very much for joining us. There is some after, so let me just close the recording.